for a woman to say, I want to have security. I want to have protection. I want to mentally feel safe. That suggests that you have been in environments where you wasn't able to do that. So you're seeking that. The only way we can provide it from a logical standpoint, though, is we got to make money. Mm. Why do I say that? The money changes our environment. If we if we if we get to a point where we're making certain type of income, you're automatically going to shift your family dynamic. The experiences you have will be different. The way you look at things will be different. That means the level of conversations you have will totally be different. That means that even if you live in, let's just say we making money and we still living in the hood. If I'm making money, my experiences is mentally taking me out of there. Mm. So that our environment suggests that my kids won't be in a position where they will feel that they parents wasn't there. Somebody will be intentionally trying to harm them or that they won't feel safe enough to express to their parents what happened in case they're in a position where we're not there. Environment dictates your outcome. And one of the things that in that really dictates your environment is finance. Yo, this video is sponsored by Los Hermanos, and it's crazy because I always wanted to have a uh, tequila sponsorship. So shout out to my guys over at Los Hermanos for taking a shot with me, doing this partnership thing. I really appreciate it. Listen, I like it so much, I might just be worse than uh, Rick Ross, bro. So if you see me on the gram, posting it all over my story and my gram, don't say nothing. Just go ahead and buy a bottle. I got it by the case. So look, we got the Blanco. We also got the Repo. And you know, my favorite is in Yeho, right? We got it on the way, you know. Like I said, we got it by the case, man. So listen, if you in Delaware, you in Georgia, you in Maryland, you in New York, you in Jersey, make sure you go to the nearest liquor store and ask for some Los Hermanos. Hey, my guys. Yo, what's poppin'? You know what time it is? Your boy, Mr. J. Hill, J. Hill Podcast. We here. Shout out to my guy, uh, Giovanni, the pro creative in the building on the boards today. He's here. Uh, we don't have a mic set up, but whatever. Um... I got a special guest in the building today doing this like business spotlight thing, but I still want to have a good conversation. So we're going to start with some business first, but we're going to go in and out of business, personal life, business, just so y'all know what he does. And if you want to like tap in with the business, you can tap in immediately, right? My guy, uh, Tariq is in the building. Dr. Black Wealth, right? I said it right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You said that's, that's trademark. Yeah. What is that? What is Dr. Black Wealth? What does that mean? So um, it's funny because um, <laughs> when I first created it, or we first created it, me and my wife did. Ooh, hold on, I mean, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> me and my wife. Yeah. Let's get it. For sure. Um, I don't think I had a meaning to it, uh -huh. but then I feel like it just kind of became who I was, right? Because yeah. when I started with Northwestern Mutual, I remember my first goal was like to learn financial literacy and all the stuff that that um, we see other people doing, and it teaches the black people. Mm. And so I took on that. And then when we was one day I was just, we was trying to think like, man, what's a good name? Be like Doctor Black Wealth. I like it. It gives a PhD feel to it. No, I'm not a, a actual doctor with it, right? Um, but we talking about black wealth. When you look at black from the financial standpoint, if mm -hmm. your numbers is in the black, you're doing good. They in the red, we got a problem, mm -hmm. right? So then we trying to get the wealth, right? Like most people try to do. And I try to help people do that and what defines it for them. How long you been doing um, financial literacy? About six, seven years. We're going to go with seven years. Yeah. So at 10 years, right? I'm about to give you the game. Okay. You might have to give me like 5% on the back end. But no, yeah. I'm messing with you. In 10 years, right? You could be like, I am a doctor because I've been studying this for 10 years. So I'm really a doctor in what I do. For sure. Ooh. Come on, man. For sure. You know I know I got over 10,000 hours. So Come that's on, man. You feel me? Like, you got, you got to find some way to put it in. Like, man, so, you know, in the curriculum, to get your doctors, you got to have a certain amount of credits, man. Yeah. I got that many credits. When I've been for doing sure. this with tape. Like, for sure. <laughs> you feel me? Like, I'm, I'm really a doctor with it. No, nah, okay. Sure. What made you, first of all, what made you um get into financial literacy, though? So um, how I landed there was, it was fun. It was Northwestern Mutual introduced it. Mm-hmm. 
So um, I thought she was about to say your wife again. I'm like, at this point, you at fifty percent. You keep going, it's gonna be like sixty five, seventy. <laughs> but I'm gonna let you go. Nah, right, go ahead, nah, go ahead. It went, nah, it went on her. Right. So what happened was, um, I used to go to Regis University. It's up in Denver. Um, we had this like social media like networking class mm -hmm. basically where we learned stuff like WordPress, Twitter, the the power of just the social networks. And so the teacher, we had a function like a networking function. And so from there, we met like different recruiters from different industries, some ones from Northwestern Mutual, other bankers, different things like that. And I looked into Northwestern Mutual, like what the recruiter and them was talking about. Mm -hmm. And then once I looked into the company, it just I just was open wide up. So what I what I, what I ended up doing was when I went to college, I was considered like a non-traditional college student because I wasn't right out of high school, 18 years, staying on campus, whatever. Um, but Northwestern Mutual had an internship program. So I was working for the government, doing the, going to school, and then I started the internship program with Northwestern Mutual. I went to their uh, – I started in the summer. Every year they do this annual, like, home office type of meeting where all the advisors get together from all over. Went to the meeting and was just, like, blown away. All the corporate Kool-Aid you can drink, I was drinking it, right? And so – it led me down a path where I was like, nobody taught me this stuff. I had to, I went to the army because I didn't think I could go to school. Like, no, I never had life insurance conversations at my table. Nobody talking business. Nobody talking like how these people talking. And so it started me down the 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 path, man. And I've been on it ever since. What? How old were you at that point? I was. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, had to be like twenty. 5, 26? 26. Okay. So you're 26. Are you you a freshman in college? At that point, I was... Um, at that point, I was technically like a sophomore going junior. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you had already went to the military. I'm just trying to paint, paint the picture. Right. I already okay. went to the military. But so now you're in school. I, and then I... Right. So I got out of the military 2014... And I started school 2014. Um, I started with Northwestern Mutual 2017. And then um, I was set to graduate 2018. Okay. So I'm trying to, at 26 years old, I'm trying to see what piqued your interest in like financial literacy. Like you said, you went to the event. It was like a corporate event. Mm -hmm. And like you, you wasn't, you never was taught none of this. Right. In my mind at 26, I'm thinking like, I'm thinking this is still boring. Right. At the moment. Like I didn't get in really click until I was like 30. Right. I'm trying to see what was in you that really sparked it, sparked the interest. That's a good question. I think it's, I think my, I think at 26, I had a certain level of like responsibility on my shoulders mm. than most people at, at that age then or my age then. Like just from how I grew up, the uh, oldest on my mom's side, um, I basically, like slick raised my brother and sister, you know what I mean? I think most most of us can go down that rabbit hole with um dealing with, you know, mom single mom stuff like that. And so I've always had like a strong sense of responsibility. So a lot of the stuff that most kids probably was doing, it wasn't me. I was already married at 18. Okay, okay, that makes sense. You know what I mean? Like so when I say stuff like, yeah, we going on, you know, 13 years, people are like, damn, you've been married for it, but I have, right? Was already married at 18. Um I was already in the army, got out 2014. Uh I pretty was like the youngest person always in my circles around different stuff. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I had, a, um, I guess another thing that could do it for me too was I had a mentor, a Masonic brother, my older brother of mine, who was... Oh, you're a Mason? Right. Oh, wow. That's dope. He was, um, he was big on like finances. He was an investor, stuff like that. And so in our lodge, you know what I mean? Like he pretty much ran the finances and I always thought that was pretty interesting. So from there, you know, I started the path down Northwestern. It just intrigued me. I was like, oh, this is it. So how how much of that helped you? Like, how much is that conversation in that room, right, in that meeting, uh, leaving that, it inspired you? But how much did it, it open your mind to being financially free or financially literate at 26 years old? With working with Northwestern? Yeah. Um, I think it helped a lot because when we look at, like, when I look at now, 
You know what I mean? A lot of stuff that I talk about might be considered boring to most people, right? I'm still trying to figure out like how to how to be cool with with the financial literacy literacy space. But I say that because I learned business in its truest form. Like I've watched people, seen people come out of like retirement, sit on boards, seen people grow businesses. We we working with um, doctors who are who we're doing financial plans for. And so having the opportunity to meet with mentors who work with business owners, um, it got me into reading books early. I was never like a huge reader. Mm-hmm. Actually, my wife was was like, she was like, you don't read books? I'm like, they boring. We have 40%. Then, you know what I mean? You but look. Read. It's almost about to be her her business. <laughs> Straight up, look. No, what is um, Every successful man is a... Is a, is a a black woman. I, I can't mean, look. I can't. I, I can't even hold something you. Like that. Yeah. yeah, I can't even hold you to it. But um, and I just started being an avid reader and rereading business. We, you know, we getting into it. And so from from looking at that perspective, man, like it just it just opened me up. It gave me all the knowledge. And so now a lot of the stuff that I'm saying today be stuff that I picked up from client experiences when I was working with Northwestern or books I've read that I'm just bringing to fruition for people to understand for their business. Okay. I ask that because like, yeah, for some people it might be boring, but I understand the importance of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to see how can we, how can we make it uh, a necessity at a young age or not even a necessity. How can we make it something that people want to get into? Even if it is boring, right? right? Hell with it. Like, who cares? Like, because this is something that we need to get into. And I'm trying to see, like, what was in your mind if you could, like, p- pinpoint it so we can give it to somebody else. And so the people that's watching, the young people that's watching, not yeah. necessarily the older ones, but or just the ones that don't know, know any better in general, that they could be like, yo, that's a wake up call. You know what I'm trying to say? Right. For you, you might not have needed a wake up call, right, but I'm trying right, to figure right. out, like, what exactly was it and what, what did it help, I guess, in your life that you could look back and, like, man, I'm so glad I was, like, I had that financially financial literacy mentality for sure um i i think it was a combination of things i looked at like how i grew up right and just like what we what i lacked growing up you know what i mean and then working in the space like what exactly what like what I like so um talking about just All right, so like I never had the experience of like I would quote on I don't even know what it's what it would be considered it, but like a childhood. You right. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. My childhood was consumed with you know, mom had to go to work, had to take care of brother and sister. It wasn't a whole lot of activities I got involved in. A little bit when I got older, you know what I'm saying? If before I did military, I was cutting grass like every two weeks. That's how I made a living going to school, right? And then we went to uh, p- working at 12th grade and then we jumped into the military because I'm like, listen, my whole plan was, I I remember when I did a, a, thir- a third grade report, Black History Report on Thurgood Marshall. So my path was like, let me go be a lawyer. Let me get to Supreme Court Justice because I'm trying to be like my man Thurgood. I wanted to go to Howard. Nobody could afford college. I never had nobody sit down and talk to me about like, yo, you could do student loans, you could do this and that, right? But I had somebody that was like, listen, you need to go, you can go, you can go to the military. So I was like, cool, let me let me do that. And I think I, I think God had a lot of it is spiritual too, because I think God had put certain people in my pathway to kind of direct my path. Like for instance, when I went to military, I was going to go reserve, so I could still go to school. Mm-hmm. So I go to military college down in Millersville transfer up to Howard my school resource officer um like knew a little bit of my upbringing what I was dealing with at home just the normal stuff most kids probably was dealing with and so um he was like yo if you go reserve you still gonna be at home he was like you just gonna get like one weekend out of the month but you still really you literally still gonna be here and I was like damn I didn't even think about that next day I called the recruiter like can I go active duty she was like, yeah. I was like, she was like, when you want to leave? I'm like, well, as soon as we can leave. We graduated like May 26. I think we was, I was going to basic like June 26. Mm. You know what I mean? And so I think then what when I was with Northwestern, I actually met a black man who's actually still my mentor and still work for Northwestern. He was one of the first black 
man to work for Northwestern and just call it top billboard, hitting all the numbers, forum advisor, stuff like that. So when I seen how successful he was, it made me think like, oh, no, I could do this. Okay. Okay. All right. So that makes sense. So it reminds me of like when I seen my friend get into tech, it shows me how much money was in tech. Yep. Right. So I have some burning questions that I want to ask because I'm really trying to like help people come out of like this uh, financial slavery. For sure. Before I ask those questions, though, uh, let me just go straight to like, what exactly do you do? How do you help people? For sure. What is so, the services that you offer? For sure. So our business, we um, we do tax strategies. The name of your business? Eagle Financial Group. Mm -hmm. Right. So Eagle Financial Group at our firm, we do tax strategies, um, basically tax planning. We do what's called CFO services, Chief Financial Officer services, where we're doing um, bookkeeping, payroll, forecasting, projection on numbers, um, kind of help people, help businesses understand their numbers. Mm -hmm. We do some business structuring. Um, and then, of course, we do the annual, well, not of course, but we do annual tax preparation every year. Why is all that stuff important for somebody that got their own business? So, um, for somebody who got their own business, if I believe that everything that you want to do in business has to come through the finance department. Mm -hmm. So if we think about organs on the body, the finance department got to be the heart. <laughs> mm. Almost, right? Like, if the heart stops, we got a problem. You know what I mean? But we can, as a business owner, right? As a young business owner, we yep. ain't talking about the mature ones yet. For right? sure. As somebody that don't know nobody, like, that's not true because... I got this far without having my finances in, in order. Right. Like I like for me is if my cameras don't work, then I can't get this done. All I right, think right, about right. is like I need to be able to to get my 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 content done. To be able right. to get my business running. Right. So so for a young business owner, right, here's what I like to I always like to meet people where they at. Mm -hmm. Young business owner, like I wouldn't deny that. You know what I mean? The only thing that I'm gonna try to instill in you is less create the habit now of looking at your numbers so mm -hmm. you can see exactly, you know what I mean? Like if I spent 2000 on the camera, how is my return on investment happening? Mm. What decisions can I make today that's going to affect how I move tomorrow, right? I think it's a difference between when you were young, like how you saying, how you saying with the example you just described, those are people who are still learning how to like get money, mm. And I don't think it's nothing wrong with that. I think that's the perfect place to be. I think if you're trying to get money, you should continue to do that till you figure out how money is starting to catch up with you. And that's normally where I meet people. Most people will be like, man, I just, you know, we we started we started our business. This year we did whatever. We did 200. We did 200,000, right? This year we done went from two to, to eight. I don't know what, I'm, what happened. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't, and that's where... I get people in those pivotal moments where it's like, no, you need bookkeeping because I can't tell you what happened. We can't come up with no more expenses, right? Right now, you just kind of you just kind of tracking along. Mm. So I always let the IRS stop you. That's that's always my thing, right? Because you're gonna file taxes sooner or later. The young person might be like, I ain't gonna file taxes. I ain't really make no money, or I don't really understand it. I ain't really doing what I'm, what I'm doing. But then two, three years go by, you're going to be like, man, I got to find somebody. I got two, three years of taxes to do. You know you made money, but you can't really tell me how you made money, where you made money, when you did it, or how you did it. it what You know, it's funny because I even, like, I hang around the guys that's, like, really making bank. Mm -hmm. I'm still one of the young ones, to be real. So, like, mm -hmm. it's funny to see the difference, and maybe you could talk to me about this, from the niggas that's really getting it. Like, they won the document everything mm -hmm. so they're not like paying so much i guess or like so so irs don't come back to get them mm -hmm. whereas like somebody might be on my level is like i'm still trying to show that i spent all my money so i can get some money back type you know what i'm saying but i feel like with the people that's making a lot of money they not really they don't want nothing back right <laughs> like it's like i just want them to know no nah, for sure i checked in yeah i'm good yeah <laughs> leave me alone like yeah. what i owe let me pay it you know what I'm yeah saying? whereas yeah. though on the other end is like we trying to get some money back we trying to show you that we ain't make no money yeah when just from your experience what's the graduation level like when do you go from trying to show that i ain't make nothing to is it the money? Is it what's in a bank account, or is it a mentality thing? Like, what, what, when do you go from one step to the other? So it's really mental. Mm. It's not even the money, right? Because I, 
I got a client who. Um, you see the audience I'm speaking to right no, now. No, no, right? for sure. <laughs> no, but but I but I know I know where it's coming from. So we what what's happening is is we become routine of habits. Mm-hmm. And so, of course, in the black community or the poor community, and I'm not just going to put it on black people in the poor community, it's a thing that our second Christmas is tax time. Mm-hmm. So we're looking for refunds. And so, in a sense, we always expect to get something from the government, right? You got to kind of catch where I'm. So we always expecting to receive something from the government no matter what. So this thing follows us no matter if you go to college and start making 80 grand a year or if you don't go to college, have some kids, whatever that looks like, and you making 30 grand a year. You always expect to receive something, right? And even if you don't receive nothing, what happens is is you for sure you never want to pay. Mm. Right? And so that's a that's a mental thing. The reason why is because we're we're just expecting something without knowing like how it works. Most of us don't even know how taxes work. Right. So I always try to break it down from an aspect of like, if you're getting a refund, essentially that means you overpaid the government. Mm. So if I work at wherever, Walmart, Amazon, and my W-2 say, listen, I made thirty thirty nine $39,000 for the year. We might have paid let's call it 6000 for the year in box two federal taxes, right? If I get a refund of any amount of money, that means I overpaid on taxes throughout the year. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? If I owe, that means either I never paid in or I didn't pay enough. Mm-hmm. So when we, which means that you got to put some in to get some out. So when you take that same mentality to a young business owner, they're like, listen, I'm trying to write off everything because I ain't trying to owe them. But at the same time, you still looking for something back. But then I have to explain, like, well, no, nah, bro, you ain't putting nothing in. Mm-hmm. All your money you got directly. You you got directly from services you did or clients that you had, right? You didn't pay the government nothing on that all year. Now we it's come it's time to file taxes. If you don't have expenses to drop what you owe, you get what I mean? Now you ain't getting nothing mm-hmm. or you're going to owe. But then the problem with that is is we get so used to now we showing negative and losses and not on that when we trying to really grow our business, because at some point you're going, you're going to, the passion is going to go from hustle mode to an elevation period. Mm. And when that happens, you look terrible on paper. I was just about to go in there because that's (laughs) something that I've just learned. Probably I'm being transparent, maybe last year. Mm -hmm. And because I think somebody was talking about like, um, when you're trying to get funding. Yeah. And it's like on taxes, right? Yeah. You right now, I ain't make no money. Yeah. So you come to a potential, a potential business partner. Yep. And you want them to front you money. They gonna be like, let me see your taxes. Let, let me see me, your taxes. Let me see your taxes. You show me your taxes, like you ain't make no money. Yeah. So like now you kind of messing yourself over yeah. in the long run when it comes to gr- potential growth. Yep. I never even knew that. It blew my mind. I'm like, bro, that makes so much sense. I'm yep. I'm busy trying to show them that. I ain't make nothing, so I don't have to pay nothing whole time. I'm not even thinking about the bigger picture. Right. And so when people do that, like I just call it, it's just your phases of money, man. It's just it's just any poor person, and and I I be particular about saying that because I used to just be like, you know, the black community. But it's not just that. When you look at numbers across the board, right? Like, not saying that racism don't exist. I'm that's not for me to say. What I am saying, though, is sometimes what's hiding in plain sight might be classism. Hey, I about to say, I was going to say it for you. I, you know what I mean? You ain't got to mess up what you got going on. <laughs> let's just say they both can exist. Let's just right, say, right. And, it's there. And, and classism definitely play a part because... It plays a huge part. Man, you could... And I'm not taking away from racism. I'm just talking about classism. Yep. You walk in any room with a with a couple M's on you, yep. everybody want to be your friend. Everybody. They don't care what you look like. Yep. Man, hey, yeah, how can I? Yeah, classism is real for sure. Yeah, it don't sure. it don't even matter. Like it, it don't matter. The the only color that really matters in in you know certain environments be green, right? And, and you know, unfortunately, green and status though, because that could be classism as well for sure. Because like you walk in, I got a million followers. How crazy this is in this world! I got a million followers, so everybody want to know my name. Yeah, it's funny because people nowadays ask they ask what's your Instagram. Or what you do before they ask your name, 
so they know how to treat you. Yeah. That's the crazy thing about it. Like, yo, what's your Instagram? What you do? So now they determine on they determine what you do by how they about to treat you next. Yep. That's crazy, man. That's it's crazy. weird, bro. It's a weird world, bro. I'm sorry, but that's no, nah, no. Nah, that's I get that, on my skin. It's that's just no. Nah, it's it's real, and so a lot of but it's a real thing too because now most people who get into business, right? That's the first thing that they thinking. They thinking like, and I I played that game where I'm like, man, I don't have no followers, so I ain't. But I've been studying behind people who don't have no following, but make. They got money. that. <laughs> I said we we all should know about we all should know better by now. But you, you know what I mean, like it's people who don't have like they, they Instagram got might be three hundred, <laughs> and it's they, they close friends. And, listen, <laughs> but you might see a a picture of a boat because they bought a boat and they right. going selling for thirty days. Like you be like what? Right. So I mean that's that's just what it is. So back so the phases of money. We have to go through our go through. Unfortunately, is unless you just is unless it's just clicked in your mind. Like for me as a profession to study this, then you kind of understand it early. Mm. But until I feel like you hit a roadblock, you won't feel to understand. Mm. You know what I mean? So if I hit you with the tax bill, and I always do that. A lot of my clients, are like say for instance, you was to come to me, you'd be like, "Yo, I need to do last two years of taxes." I'm going to show you what it really looks like. Like, look, you put your stuff in, um, and, and this is what most people do. Like, oh, I ain't, you know, well, I got this, that, and the third. This is, here's my expenses. So I'd be like, okay, cool. I'm going to put them in. Boom. You made half a meal. You probably got 200 grand of expenses. You're trying to show me there's 300,000 that you got in profit. LLC, you paying taxes. <laughs> my guy or girl, you paying taxes. 15.3% self-employment tax, right? We at 300 grand, so that's probably we over a 24% tax bracket, right? It's over 40% taxes that you paying. Mm. Now, when I'm looking at it and then I hit you with that, you feel that. you like, I ain't. Even if you got it, you like, I don't want to yeah, give it to the government. Yeah, yeah. So it's, what's the next question? Well, what can I do to drop that? Well, what other expenses do you have? What have we documented? What does the business do, right? What, and so now I'm helping you come up with stuff to drop it. So even if I move the needle a little bit, now I become the saver. But guess what happens? After we filed it, you felt it. Now you're like, how can we prevent this from next happening next year? Mm. You know what I mean? Is there any way to prevent that, though? It is. It's ways to drop it. So I'm never, I'm, you know, I've. I'm always like, look, if we can pay nothing legally, let's do it. But depending on your type of business, it might not. That requires some planning. And what happens is, is a lot of us are reactive instead of proactive. So I'm trying to get out there to be like, no, we need to be more proactive than reactive. You know what I mean? Like, so if we're looking at it now, there are ways. There's ways we could change the entity from an LLC to go S Corp. Yeah. Right? And what most people, most benefit? people know. So the benefits of the S Corp is is you really get out of pan. Well, let me explain it for real. You really shift the self-employment taxes that you pay and you shift it from um, paying it on your taxes to paying it on your W-2. Because as the owner, you have to be on, on payroll mm. of an S-Corp. If you, if you own the S-Corp, you got to be on payroll as the S-Corp. And so those same like self-employment tax, the 15.3%, what that made of is the Social Security, Medicare, to all the all the taxes that come out your W-2 check. Well, what's going to happen is, is you're going to end up paying that in payroll taxes, essentially. But the beauty about it is you get to deduct the payroll taxes. Because you work. Because you yourself. work for yourself yeah. and it's an expense of the business. Mm. Get what I mean? So now you get to expense that out. The other, the other ben good benefits of it, too, is is this is the beginning of you actually running a real a real, a real business. Yeah. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And it's nothing against the LLCs because I love them. They're very flexible. You can do a lot of different things with it. You know what I mean? But the the escort makes you more, it, it's taking you from level A to level B. Yeah. You know what I mean? Now, because it's we got to have annual meetings. We got to have, and you might be like, well, what's the annual meeting? Well, and if it, what if it's just myself? Well, plan out what's going to happen. Right. Sit with your accountant or your lawyer or whoever that may be or sit with yourself. Next year, I plan to do this, 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 this and this based off our projections or based off where I plan to go. It's really just you writing out your goals, which could be helpful when it do come down to, to planning for taxes. Because if I sit here and look at your stuff and be like, yo, you about to make 
um, 300 grand in profit. Um, how can we shift that? Well, you didn't pay yourself. That's one thing we can do. We can put you, we can put you on payroll. The second thing we might do is do you need a vehicle, right? We might invest in that way. Do we want to do real estate, right? Cause that's the, one of the, uh, highest forms of tax planning tax right there facts. is getting into real estate. Um, but then when we, when it's time to get in real estate, guess what happens? You got to look good on paper, depending on what you're trying to do. Mm. You see what I mean? So it all's like, it all play a part. So S Corp, I think makes you that more, that much more conscious of what you're doing as a business owner. Well, as LLC, it's almost like LLCs are treated. Most of us treated like a side business. Well, I got a little something on the side, you know, I babysit a braid on the side, nothing real major. I got an LLC, you know, she had got to have an LLC, whatever, right? Mm-hmm. We, and so we don't really treat it like a business, but the IRS does. That's mm-hmm. why it's the highest audited tax return. Wow. So that's another benefit because once you switch to S Corp, you're like, I'm not going to say you're not going to get audited, but you a thousand percent less likely to get audited just switching to an S Corp. And it's a separate set of taxes. Your business do taxes, and you still got to do personal taxes. Mm. Yo, question: What's the real number that you're supposed to put up when it comes to like being self-employed? So let's do. If I make a thousand dollars, how much should I be putting up in the bank for my taxes at the end of the year? I I normally say somewhere between ten to fifteen percent. See, that's weird because I be some sometimes hit thirty percent and forty percent. Yeah, but I so for me, I'm gonna say ten to fifteen percent. The reason for it is because depending on how much. So let's just say let's according to each month's revenue, I'll say that. Okay. So over a, a 12 month period, right? Every, every month we probably put in somewhere between 10 and 15 okay. percent. We'll have some on there because there's going to be some there's going to be some tax. There's going to always be some tax savings that we might have never thought of. That's not documented on your in your books or stuff like that. Right. And that's that could be something as simple as a home office deduction. Mm. That could be something that can drop you down. If we start doing tax planning right, is real estate, right? Which could wipe out your tax bill altogether. So I'm always like 10 to 15% because we can always plan to kind of get, you know what I mean? To to kind of course what we're trying to do. Now, if you know you ain't trying to pay. If you know you ain't trying to do all that stuff, you don't have time for it, you want to do it, then you can go 30, 40%. What it might do is leave you with some money left over because you might not have, you still might not have to pay all that in taxes. Okay. Yo, where do people, where do people uh, go wrong the most in just financial literacy in general? Uh, I just, I think people go wrong because we're not like conscious of what we're doing, and I see that. Give me an example though. Like, if you had to point it out, what would something going wrong look like? Um, and it might sounds like it's not going wrong because it's going good, but I think when you coming from a place of not having a lot, not making no money. That's where I was going to go. Yeah. Right. To we talking, we talking struggling, we talking poverty, we talking PJs, we talking single parent. We can even be talking, uh, even if you got mom and dad at home. But we coming from a place of you never made six figures. So, which means you never made seven figures. When we start to hit those numbers, we don't watch what we're doing. So, we don't, we can't pinpoint how we got there. Mm hmm. Which means that we can't backtrack to figure out expenses oh. for taxes. Yeah. Which means that we can't backtrack to figure out activity to do it again. Come on, man. Which means that we can't we can't forward project stability in income. Mm, mm-hmm. And when you come from having nothing, it's still, we still in that first phase of of ha- of we still in that first phase of money. You come from having nothing. The first thing you're trying to do is get all the things that helps compensate you having money. So now we buying the clothes. Mm-hmm. Now we buying the toys. Now we buying access to people. So now we keeping up with the next man or woman, but we still don't even know how we got here. Mm. And I think that's the that's always the problem. And I'm saying that from a place of like. I've seen people come across my desk, may go from $100,000 a year employed 
to 800 grand a year from a business, most of it was from coaching and consulting, right? But then we still can't figure out the gap between 100 grand to 800 grand of how we even got here. And then now it's time to do taxes and we scramble. We don't know what to do. Mm. So it holds us up from doing anything. Right. And it's crazy because, like, again, I'm gonna keep trying to put it back on our level. Go ahead. From zero to 100. Yeah. And 200 grand. Yeah. yeah, yeah you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, it's the same because when you explain it from like 100 to 800, I'm like, shit, I was going through that from zero to 100. For sure. You know what I'm saying? Like, I remember my first time making 100. I'm like, damn, bro. Like, I did it. I can do it again, but how? Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, it feels, it it feels, it almost feels um, like, like you're hopeless, not hopeless, but um, impossible almost sometimes. Cause it's like, bro, I just did it. I don't know how I'm about to do this again. I need it now. Because once you go to that, like you said, now, I think one of the biggest mistakes is we make the money and now we have our lifestyle be dependent on the money that we made. Yeah. So now anything go wrong, you you messed up. Yeah. You feel me? So it's yeah. like, and when things go wrong, as they will go wrong, you got all these expenses and it's like, damn, yeah. I, like I just made this much money. I just made 350. Yeah. Just made three. I don't know where, man. But you got the expenses of making three fifty. Yeah. And now you ain't making three fifty. Now you ain't making three fifty. Do you think we? Is that reversible? In the African American culture, I'm gonna talk about African American culture for sure because that's why I say it. That's why I say it a lot. Do you think that's reversible? Because I feel like all of us that come from nothing, we gotta get a taste of something yeah. and we gotta learn from it. Yeah. I think it is, but I think I think you have to go through that experience for you to see it. But especially is it, for us, is it possible? For us not to, for us to reverse it so we don't have to go through that. So we can hit it, hit the ground running, and the first time we do it, we do it right. Or no. Yeah, I I think so because we in a time period of just, you know, as the big people I guess on the ground might call it the financial revolutionary, right? Every mm-hmm. everybody's being conscious of like making more money, becoming out of like what our parents was between the millennials and the Gen Z's. That's automatically like a different type of ch- habit that people are going in. So is it reversible? For sure, I think it's reversible because I don't think what we went through was nothing that was like, I I think we repeat cycles. And when you look at history, I think it repeats itself. Mm-hmm. There's a time period where, where we was doing really good. We think about like the late 1800s, 19, early 1900s, the golden age of, of black businesses or where there were black people who were successful. We were doing business with white people, all that type of stuff, which is how Jim Crow was even was even founded, right? Because black businesses were doing so good, they were cutting out a lot of white businesses. Mm. So now the South said, hey, we're going to put in Jim Crow. Jim Crow going to keep your people over there. It's going to keep my people over here. And when that, segreg- when that happened, um, there was a decline and it's more especially in our community and our businesses. But now you and it, I feel like it's been like that ever since now between COVID and now we probably have more black businesses, more successful or failure or failed businesses all the same who started, stopped, started, stopped and trying to seek a different pathway. Mm-hmm. So I think with more people like us having conversations about this, getting that exposure out there. You can reverse them habits early because we not I'm not telling you nothing that if you I'm not telling you nothing that if you start now, you could be somebody different because we got the case studies on it. So just like you said, I know I went from uh, 100 grand to 800, but the same stuff applies from 100 grand. to I'll say less than three hundred thousand or less. Mm. Right. Because you you never made I mean, you think about that. In math, all we got to really do is move the decimal and the number either gets bigger or smaller. Yeah, yeah. Right? So when you think about something like that, it's a small change that could blow your world up from forty grand a year to $100,000 a year. Mm. And if we making $100,000 a year, we making anything over eight grand a month. That's a lot of money. For somebody who never had that type of money. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so you have to go through those experiences to understand the feel of having money. Because the first thing you're going to do, bro, that's our community. We're going to see the stuff. We want all the, we want all the things. 
But what happens is, is a lot of us are getting, we're getting deeper in our relationships, period. So the fulfillment we thought we were going to get from having all the things is still not there. Mm. So it got us seeking, which we can recreate the activity to get the money again. But now you experienced, you, you went through an experience of a different type of loss or a new journey. And so you get excited about the process mm. or maybe I'm just talking about me, right? You get excited about the process of like, yo, I made a hundred grand. I never made that. I never thought I would see that. I never, I never understood what it, what it was to even be considered a six figure earner. Mm -hmm. And then now to make that you're going to do whatever th is in your hands possible to do to rebuild it, recreate it, right, and sustain it. Mm -hmm. And one of the first people you're going to have to run across is probably going to be somebody who understands money a little bit. Mm. You know what I mean? And I think when you experience that, it puts you in a different frequency, different mindset, and it makes you be that much more attentive to what you're doing. Mm. Yo, you're talking about running into somebody with that mindset. I think community is the biggest part of building a mindset yeah. Like that, like just the environment in general. Yeah. Because when you get around certain people, it's a new standard. Yeah, for right? sure. And then now if that's the standard, it's like you don't want to be below the standard. Yeah. So now you're trying to live up to the standard. Yeah. So like, but I, I say that because like, <clears throat> I never forget, man, my first year, I, it was like probably two, two and a half years ago. First year making like $100,000. And I just, at the end of the year, I was like, damn, like, where did it all go? And I remember the same thought came my first time making over two hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and I'm like, "What the? No way!" I'm like, "No way!" It, like me, mm -hmm. where did it all go? Mm -hmm. Where is it at? Mm -hmm. And I just remember like when I had a hard time, like a hard patch. I was like, it just, it almost like it was discouraging because it was like, man, I made this, I ain't never made that. Was that just a thing? Mm -hmm. Like, was that just a, 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 a like a moment? Right. It's like, nah, I know we're gonna get it back again, but how? Right. But if I was able to, like you said, put things in place, yeah. I would know exactly how. I would know exactly how to do it again. Yeah. So like, I don't. It's like, and going through that, me personally, I don't want nobody to go through that because I know how that felt at the moment. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's like, how can we get these kids to, or young adults or whoever? to fight those urges of going to get it, everything they desire. Mm -hmm. Like to fight that urge of not just being patient, right? Like, and I'm just like, I don't know, bro. Cause people, at the end of the day, somebody told me this before. When a nigga got everything, you can't tell him nothing. Yeah. When a nigga don't got nothing, you can't tell him nothing. Yeah. <laughs> so at the end of the day, you can't man. tell these niggas nothing. Yeah. So man. it's like, but like in my mind, like I just want to, I want people to skip those mistakes that I made for sure. For sure. I I used to feel that way, but then the more people who used to come across our office, I felt like it was a it was a necessary part of the process. Mm. So I think about, um, I think about on. Um, so I'm I watch Marvel. So I think about Doctor Strange when um the ancient one told him like she said you can't beat a river into submission. You gotta surrender to it. You know what I mean? And so when I heard that, I was like, Man, that's crazy. So it's like we trying to prevent people from kind of like you gotta go against the current and it's hard. You know what I mean? Because you walking up upstream to a river was currency that's going a different way. But if you surrender to it, I think the natural flow will kind of guide you where you need to go. Mm -hmm. And those flows come with them, them pain points. And I think that um, for most people, unless you come in from a place like, like your children might see it different, but that will be because you went through the experiences it would be because you went through the experiences and you have them in an environment that was unlike ours coming up. So only thing that they see is 
from this level up, mm. right? But you're still holding on to from this level down because you've been there. They haven't. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So their level of their currency flow is going to be different from somebody like ours because we coming from a place of we never had nothing. So you 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 add that with the trust issues we got with ourselves, right? It's hard for people to trust other people's word or t- or listen to what they got to say when they barely can trust their own word. Mm. So your experiences allow you to build your trust within yourself. And in them dark moments, you know what I mean? It's almost like, well, <laughs> um, let me be quoting a, uh, cartoon movies all day but it's almost like what what bane said like i i you adopted the dark i grew up I in grew it up in, you know what i mean you know it's funny <laughs> nah, i watched i watched batman because it's like um i was just and this is off topic but yeah. uh, i literally just um quoted that movie like the other day was it yesterday when um kendrick lamar dropped uh I think he dropped uh, 616 in L.A. He ain't even dropped the last one yet. What's the last one? Not Like Us. He ain't dropped that. Because I'm a Drake fan. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, come on, bro. Get up. I'm like, like, even Batman got up when Bang had him down. (laughs) So, like, when you said it, I get it. Because, like, I'm like, even Batman got up, bro. Yeah, like, like, get up. Like, get up. Yeah. But, nah, man. Nah, that's – bro, that – but that example that you, you said about the current, and, um, I'm not gonna lie to you, bro. It gave me a little bit of it gave me a sense of peace a little bit to yeah. be honest, because I am naturally like, um, I'm a super like empath sometimes, mm-hmm. right? But I think that comes from wanting to go against the cur- current. Mm-hmm. Or not even go against it. It's it's me going through the mud yeah. and not wanting my peers to go through it. Yeah. But like you said. The more you resist it, the harder it is, right? Yeah. So even like painting a picture, like your friends sometimes or your children, right? Yeah. Let's, let's say children. Sometimes all we want our children to do is not go through the pain that we went through. Yeah. So we try to do everything in our power to ha- for them not to do what we did. Yeah. When all that's going to happen is they're going to do it anyway and it's going to crush us. Yeah. When all we got to do is just allow life to happen. Yeah. Would that be hard? It's like, this is mind blowing because we, we talk about finance literacy, but it's crazy because it's life. It's like, and it's easier said than done, but all you got to do is, and you spiritual, watch it. We could talk about it. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Yeah. The courage to change the things I can, yeah. but the wisdom to know the difference. And a lot of these things we have no control of. Yeah. So we just got to accept it. And again, this is outside of financial literacy, but it's made me think about it because like in my mind, it's like every, every time I get on this podcast, it's like, Yo, how can we help these people not go through this? Because I go yeah. through this. Yeah. But in reality, you probably can't. You, you just gotta allow them to go through it and don't be as resistant for them going through it. Cause the more you try to hold them back from going through it, the more they're not gonna like you. The more yeah. they they they're gonna miss your message, the yeah. more they might resent you. Yeah. And it's like all I'm trying to do is help. Yeah. Whole time I'm trying to help and you resent me for, for trying. Damn, that's crazy. Yeah. This is crazy. We supposed to be talking about money. But no, this but, is crazy. but what's what's crazy is we, we still talking about money. Mm. And we talking about business. I learned more from my life from working or from doing business than anything I've ever done. And so financial literacy opens you up to like you be so finance finances is the one thing that that connects everything. It's like the dots that connect everything. Mm. How you spend money and the type of person you Will, will determine the type of person you are. Mm. Type of person you are will determine how you use money when you have it. Mm. If we start a business, that determines the type of businessman or woman you are. If we have experiences and never experience losses through adversity is how I determine the true character of a man. Mm-hmm. And so, but what's hard is, is we try to control the things that we feel we should have control over instead of surrendering to them. And I always think about, I don't care how much money I ever make in my lifetime. I will never forget the spirit or calmness I had when we had nothing. Mm. 
when my car was repossessed because I was out of town on a business trip. And it's me, my wife, four, so it's six of us in a two-bedroom apartment. And navigating through that space, I would wake up early uh, to catch the early bus to go downtown. I'm living in Colorado Springs. I'm living in Colorado, state that was 4% black, mm. right? I, I don't think nothing I've been through has just been out of design, out of, out of, I like out of purpose. 4% black, whole state. So I would get up early to catch the bus to get into the office early so nobody would see me coming off the bus station. It's snowing. We went almost like, I want to say 10, 11 months with no car. But in those moments, I still remember periods where we just lived life. We was happy. We didn't have much, right? But we would, I would sit in them storms so I can understand how to get out of it. You know what I mean? And I surrender to it. That's why I said when you say what's the biggest, uh, the biggest thing, I'm saying we're not conscious of where we are. And because we can't control it, a lot of us seek devices to escape it. But the whole time is the more that you sit in that darkness, the more you find out who you are and and the type of person you can be. We don't even give ourselves the chance to be all we can be because we never start to even start. Mm, mm, mm. How do we get here? This is crazy. <laughs> this is fire. I'm like, damn. Damn, this is so... I'm like, this is crazy. Yo, let me ask you this, though. Oh, I might go deeper. Pause. You married 13 years. Mm-hmm. Were you, are y'all were y'all on the same page with that? Because it's easy for you to feel that way. But if your partner not feeling that way, right? In those moments, it could be hard. Right? Like were y'all mm-hmm. on this were y'all like, did y'all at that point, did y'all think the same? Like y'all was like on the same accord with that when he's struggling, no car, like we just sitting in the dark. Because sometimes you could be in a partnership and you might feel like that way and yeah. you might be calm, but your partner might think, you know, a lot, you're not really caring. Yeah. And it's like, man, I'm just embracing. I can't do nothing about it. You know what I'm yeah. saying? But how was it for you? Um, It definitely was a struggle. So we, there were periods where we were on the same page. I think there were a lot of periods where we were on the same page. I think at the same time, though, there were frustrations of us not getting where we desire to get in our own timing. Mm. And it showed up in various ways. That's why I say we still own financial literacy. When I took a step back and like assessed arguments, upbringings, the fights we would have, then the children we would have, then the fights we would have. A lot of it boiled down to lack of finances. Mm. You know what I mean? So I heard, um, was it was it Tabitha, I think? Um, we was at a conference. I think it was the ET 360 Man Conference he did a couple years ago. And so Tabitha Brown was like, you know, when married couples get into arguments, and we arguing over trash, but she was like, but it's really not about the trash can. Like, it's not the trash can. You just, you just went off because I put leftovers in the trash can, but that's not what you really mad about. You mad about something else. And so as a man, I think two things is happening as a man. One is me learning how to be a man <laughs> at a young age with a wife, right? That's a different type of commitment Mm -hmm. and so i think when it came down to it commitment was a key thing that kept us committed because there were times where she was like i was like man i'm out i remember calling my mom like look i ain't trying to deal with this like i don't have to i don't i could go (laughs) yeah i feel like that's probably for real i could walk out today yeah and i'd be good that's what we all say like i'll be straight straight, right Right. i'm good now she the one (laughs) You feel me? Like, she gonna have to... Right. And that's exactly how I was. Yeah. And my mom was like, no, nah, you married. Mm. I'm like, man. I'm not okay. trying to hear that. Yeah, I, yeah you know what I mean? I'm, I'm not trying to hear that. And then, so, 
I could put this out there. So when, a lot of our first, let's say first early on stuff was about um, the fact that my wife didn't work. So throughout our marriage, my wife really didn't work. It, re, it was some periods where she got a couple jobs. Um, one was out of just like, hey, I just want to get out here and I need a break. Um, the other two were like, you know, we in a we in a bad spot. Mm. Shout and, out to that. Yeah. She, you know, she like, we in a bad spot. So I'll, you know, do a little something and it'd be what it's what, what it's gonna be. But when I was growing up, I watched my mom work every day. Mm. I watched my grandma work every day. We're talking about my grandma worked in New York over 50 something years on a job, never not worked. So in my mind, I'm thinking everybody work. Mm. So when I'm getting married, I go off into the army. I'm going to work. I come home and it appears like you chilling. Mm -hmm. If I'm working, damn it, you working too. So we our arguments was based off that. But check this. It wasn't until some, I'm talking about, had to be at least four or five years, maybe three, four years past. We went to a therapy session and I discovered that she never wanted to work because she watched her mom work all the time mm. and her dad didn't work. And so in her mind, she's like, women ain't supposed to work or I don't want to work. I don't want to recreate what my mom been through. You know what I mean? So before that, what made me ease up off of it was I called my dad. I'm like, man, look, I'm working. She need to work. She don't want to get no job. Like what's happening? My dad told me straight up, he said, look, as a man, you the maintainer and a provider of your house. He said, if your wife decide to work, um, so be it. But that shouldn't stop you from paying bills or shouldn't affect your money. So when he told me that, I let it go. I never had an argument about it. Then years later, I discovered why she didn't want to work. You know what I mean? So I say that because most times in marriage, I think the first few years you're trying to I'm trying to match her to what I've been accustomed to mm. she's trying to match me to what she's been accustomed to mm. and the whole times the the customs of which we've been accustomed to are full of shit mm. excuse my you know what I mean it's, yeah. it's not backed by nothing because we both coming from broken homes we both coming from poverty we both coming from families with you know, this person got kids. It's six of us over here, three of us over here. We mm. both coming from spaces of like trauma that we really don't need to bring in with us. Yo, I say when it's come to that type of stuff, I say like, you know, this new age thing is like standing on business, right? Yeah. And I'm like, bro, we always trying to stand on some business that ain't gonna hold us up when we need it to be held up. Yeah. Like you standing on ego that's just fragile yeah like what business are you standing on nah cause you ain't gonna do this and I ain't allowing nobody to okay yeah. who now what yeah right and it's like we really be standing on nothing yeah I think about it paint a picture for all my homies out there a nigga play you in the street or or let's say somebody try to rob you mm-hmm Right, and this is for my people. Nigga try to rob you. You got chain, jewelry, all that, right? Now I'm standing on business. Anybody about to take nothing from me? All right, you try to fight back. Mm -hmm. Let's say I ain't even going to go to the worst because he can shoot you and kill you, right? Let's not even go to the worst. Let's say he don't have a gun, but he stab you. I don't know. Stab, poke you out. Mm -hmm. Now you can't see. Was that worth you just giving up your jewelry? Right. No, but it's not why I said like, it's like we be standing on business that don't support us. Yeah. It's like what like in, in a relationship, same way. Yeah. It's like, okay, I'm gonna stand on this business and then we break up. And it's like it it it, it just don't make sense. Yeah. You get what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. And what, what and, and ultimately it's like, bro, how do we go with the current camera? Right. But at the same time, still allowing ourselves st still being out being true to ourselves. Yeah, for sure. You know what I'm saying? I think what happened is we get the lines get blurry. Mm-hmm. We don't know who we are truly, so we can't go with the current allowing 
us not to lose ourselves because we don't know who we are. Yeah. It's like, nah, I'm I want to be me. Okay, who tell me who you are? Yeah. Because I'm pretty sure you don't even know who you are yet because you ain't find it yet. And that's okay. Yeah. It's just, I don't know. This is this is crazy. We supposed to be talking business. So let's get back to business. <laughs> I, but I, I think we that, still we still we still on it. I say that to say, I say that though, all of, all of that. Because I think this is Neo's favorite line, even though I heard it before Neo, but whatever. I'm gonna give it to Neo. <laughs> how you do one thing mm-hmm. is ultimately how you do all things. Yeah, yeah. Right? So if you can stay mentally fit, time is back to business. Yeah. Mentally disciplined in your in any part of your life, your relationship, your business, then you can apply that same mentality to everything in your life. Yeah. Cause it's get hard. Yeah. With everything. Well, how, how who are you going, who are you going to show up as in those moments of adversity? Yeah. Which at at the end of the day shows your character. For sure. I think um I think this is probably where I'll lean more on men. I think that men, we as men need a true purpose. Mm. And sometimes in order to get to find our purpose, we might have to do work until it leads us to our purpose. Mm. So I think that when households and relationships and the things that come around us, like, because what happens is it, it's a distraction. Mm-hmm. And I think you can easily get distracted when you're not mentally focused on a certain thing in your life. Mm-hmm. So when you think about it, and so how do I know that to be true? I think my life serves as an example of it, being that I feel everything I've done or did and will do, I feel like I'm always led to do it. Or God speaks to me in a certain way, and it's like, hey, go this way. But let's just take it out of me. We could go right into Genesis. Um, Notice that when God created the heavens and earth, right, in six days, he rested on the seventh. He was very detailed in what he created, when he created. Mm -hmm. And notice the creatures and creation was created before he even made man Mm -hmm. you know what i mean so the jobs was here before he put a man on earth to give him a job and that's the first thing he did when i created adam we have a particular job here's the job description here's what you can do here's what you can't do then god said man i don't think it's it's not good for man to be alone And he created the woman in a way that it helped Adam continue to fulfill the job he had because he had purpose and he had an anchor. So something always held him, held him close to be like, I got a, I got a extra reason why I'm doing this. And he was already given a job. For most men, I don't think that we keep our hands busy enough in the right way to where we could cut out distractions. Because at the end of the day, the blurry lines that we see, they become they are really distractions. If anything is keeping you from where you're trying to get to, it's a distraction. And if you might be like, I'm not I don't know where I'm trying to go. But if you really listen to the to to your inner voice on what it's telling you to do. It could be simple as let me start off with Amazon. Everything I I didn't come out the womb. Like, yo, we, we about to be financial literacy. I went from high school to the military. I knew I wasn't going to stay in the military because I overheard uh, a higher ranking um, person in the military. This was everybody in the military get paid on the first and the 15th. This is probably day 10 we uh, just did PT. I stayed at the barracks to shower, change all that stuff, get ready for work. I'm overhearing these two E7s take a shower um, while, I'm sh- while I'm showering. But he's like, hey, man, let's go get some breakfast. This dude was like, man, I can't go get no breakfast till we get paid on the 15th. 
And I'm like, I'm an E3, E4 at the time. I know what my money be looking like. How you E7 and you can't even get breakfast today till you get paid on the 15th. It just didn't add up for me. So I'm like, man, I got to do 20 some years in here to get higher ranking and possibly still deal with, with financial issues like this. That's crazy. Right. Which led me to be like, no, I'm not staying 20 years in here. Got out. Um, went, went to college, working the government job, which led me to Northwestern Mutual. Got fired from Northwestern Mutual, which led, led me into the, the partnership we created with my dad. And through the trauma led me to Eagle Financial Group. So the point was I stayed busy doing something. We was we was moving the needle. Might not have been moving as fast, but we just well, you move that decimal at one point. I think <clears throat> that's definitely true. I think also to add on that, I think um when it specifically we talk about men, something that I I I I uh had challenges with. I think men need to do a better job at learning balance. Cause I don't think it's a busy thing. I think it's being able to balance two things at once mm -hmm. or compartmentalize. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, if I'm by myself, I'm single. <sighs> what? I'm going crazy. <laughs> what? Like, I'm busy. Yeah. I'm living in my purpose. Yeah. I'm lit. Yeah. The moment I add a woman to that, now I blame her for knocking me off my purpose. Mm -hmm. When really, I just don't know how to balance the two. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like men get so tunnel vision or laser focus on the goal that we have, the end goal, mm -hmm. and getting there. And I don't think there's nothing wrong with that. But we have to understand that that ain't just, it, life ain't just that. When as mm -hmm. men, I feel like it's easy to, to put life as just the end goal. Mm -hmm. Because we're goal oriented, right? Like we problem solvers. It's like, mm -hmm. man, I got a vision, I'm going to get to this vision. Mm -hmm. But when you add somebody into it, especially a woman, I've noticed just from my experience that our goals don't always be the same, especially not at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I got to be able to learn how to deal with those emotions or deal with that when it's not the same. Mm -hmm. Right? Because I might be like, man, I'm not trying to focus on that, but I got to. Mm -hmm. But to me, that's knocking me off my, my, that's knocking me out off my mission. When it's like, if I can learn how to balance the two, be focused but, but continue to be present, right? To continue to be emotionally present and, and aware, then I think that's how we really un unlock like the third eye, if mm -hmm. that's the word for it. Because I, I think um my one of my my said this. He was going, he was going through some things, and I never forget, he was like, man, I went to the track. We're gonna cut out. But I remember he said he was going through some things with his wife. Mm -hmm. And so if you give me a timestamp, he's like, we're going, he was going through some things with his wife, right? And um, he's like, he went to the track and he seen a lady and he's like, hey, can I ask you a question? And at first she was like, kind of like nonchalant. Like, he was like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm married. I don't want to like talk to you about nothing like that. I just want to ask you a question. He was like, man, what makes a woman happy? And you know, we, we thought, he thought, I thought, she was going to say, like, you know, uh, stability. And she was like, nah. Um, I think she said, like, mental, uh, like, feeling safe mentally or something like that. Something mm -hmm. like that, right? Mm -hmm. And he was like, it threw him off. Because he's like, huh? Like, what? And he was like, to him, it didn't make sense because men are so logical, right? But women can be emotional. Mm -hmm. And, like, sometimes the two don't mesh because mm -hmm. you can't really be logical with feelings. Like, one is the truth and like one is how you feel. Like, mm -hmm, it's subjective. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. But when she said that, it kind of, it kind of made sense to him like why he was clashing with his wife because it's like, wow. Like, sometimes she just want to feel safe. Mm -hmm. Sometimes she just want to feel like I care, I'm there, like I'm mentally present. Mm -hmm. But as a man, it's when, when we buy ourselves, I'm trying to tie together, I don't got time for how I feel. Mm -hmm. I gotta focus on my goal. Mm -hmm. But when you add somebody to that, you gotta learn how to adapt. Right. And I think that'd be the hardest thing for for a man. So I think that's probably one of the biggest keys. What you said, like having goals is is definitely for sure. Like definitely stay busy. But I feel like once you get there, you gotta learn how to adapt in the moments when it ain't just you. I don't know. I I don't know if that made sense. But I just feel no, like it do. But 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 what happens is. <laughs> 
right. This shit just got crazy. I don't even know how we, bro. We just went we going crazy. But go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so what happens is we have to be we have to really be particular about the partners we we have. Mm. And I think you have to question how did y'all become partners? Mm. Because <laughs> when most times when you meet a partner, both of y'all are at a certain point. Nine times out of 10, you might be very close together than you are apart on that same level, mm. right? Which which sparks the attraction. So we talking about a man who, let's say level one, and his goal point is to get to level 10. Well, through that transition, there's growing pains that you have to go through to get there. At the same time, I don't necessarily want to call it balance, but at the same time that we get into a rhythm of something or pattern of something, right? If we're growing, like your spouse have to be willing to take that journey. Mm. That doesn't mean that you get to count he or she out of what it is that they want or not be present in the moment. But it still means that we still got to hold the goalposts, mm. right? So when a, if I was to hear a woman say, like, I want to be mentally safe, mm. right? Having that balance of the emotions will be from a logical perspective. I would just simply ask, well, what does that mean? And I don't think we do that. Mm. I think we try to understand it in our peg of knowledge of like, well, this is how I feel this is. Instead of trying to empathize or sympathize or just harmonize with the other individual, especially a woman, and say, well, what does that really mean to you? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And a lot of that stuff be taken from places of, watch how this ties to financial literacy. <laughs> a lot of that stuff be taken from places of like how they grew up in the environments that they were in. Mm -hmm. Somebody was raped. Somebody was molested. Somebody felt abandoned. My dad wasn't there. My brothers didn't keep me safe. Somebody should have stopped such and such from touching me. You know what I mean? Somebody should have showed me a different way of life. And for a woman to say, I want to have security, I want to have protection, I want to mentally feel safe, that suggests that you have been in environments where you wasn't able to do that. So you're seeking that. The only way we can provide it from a logical standpoint, though, is we got to make money. Mm. Why do I say that? The money changes our environment. If we if we if we get to a point where we're making we're making certain type of income, you're automatically going to shift your family dynamic. The experiences you have will be different. The way you look at things will be different. That means the level of conversations you have will totally be different. That means that even if you live in, let's just say we making money and we still living in the hood. If I'm making money, my experiences is mentally taking me out of there. Mm. So the, I, our environment suggests that my kids won't be in a position where they will feel that their parents wasn't there. Somebody will be intentionally trying to harm them or that they won't feel safe enough to express to their parents what happened in case they're in a position where we're not there. Environment dictates your outcome. And one of the things that in that really dictates your environment is finance. I mean, that's hundred percent true. I think, I think, I agree with you. I don't know if all the ladies would. I agree with you. Right. Let me just go with that because I get it. I think all yeah. men would say that because, like, man, you want to change your life and get some damn money. That's For not sure. like get some money. You know what I'm saying? Sure. But uh, nah, this is fire, bro. Like so. How can somebody like reach out to you, get you to help them with what they got going on? For sure, man. Y'all listen, y'all want to tap in. Y'all can um Instagram. I'm on there as Dr. Black Wealth, TikTok, Dr. Black Wealth. Um y'all can reach out uh eaglefinancialgroup.com, eaglefsg.com. That's our website. 
Um, you for sure call our office, 719-755-0043. Um, reach out, ask for me, click the links in my bio, Calendly. Everything is out there, Calendly. Uh, we do free consultations, so, you know, any business owner need help. Uh, we do taxes all year, so we still doing taxes, still doing tax planning. Um, so those are the type of things you, if y'all want to reach out. What are some innovative ways that you're, like, approaching financial literacy? Um, I think I do it through business. So from financial literacy, I'm more so trying to create the – I'm trying to create the businessman or woman, man – being yeah. unisex, right? Um, behind the business. So when I say that, like a lot of my stuff, I reach at it from a different perspective where I'm trying to teach you how businesses are ran. So if you watching, if you ever took the chance to watch CNBC, Squat Box, that's my show, right? Or um, let's just say we tuning in and watching Trap. Trap talking three hours on stocks. But stocks is a direct reflection of how a business is actually ran, right? Mm -hmm. If we look at it, what the CEO do, how they hire, who they hire, where they spending money, how they spending money, that's marketing, right? And so the way I approach it is, is we first, we need access to capital. Go sell something. Go create money. Go figure out what that is. Get good at the skill. Now, as soon as we are good at the skill, learn business if not learn it at the same time and when i say business that means like what's an llc what knowing that i'm supposed to file my um register my business with the state every year right understanding what my taxes are understanding um what goals i have what activity i need to get there how to get there understanding that at some point i gotta have a team right so i call it the entrepreneur's quadrant we go from founder to CEO, to business owner, to investor. As a founder, you're in the period of like, I'm making money. I'm good at, I figured out something that I'm good at or want to be good at, and I'm doing it. We probably made a little money. If whether it was $5, $10, $100, my first $100,000 a year, that's cool. Taxes come or or we elevate our life in a sense, right? Now we switching from CEO because what happens is, is you probably get burnt out. So it's two mindset shifts we got to change when we hit the CEO level. The one of them, one of them is, is I got to learn how to release from doing everything and putting things in other people's hands. That's becoming a leader. Mm -hmm. The other part about it is um, you doing so well, you got no choice but to release it. Mm -hmm. So you got to start to hire people. You got to start to manage people. That's a level of leadership that comes with that, Right. Um, and so understanding what CEOs do, how do we, how we hire people, how do we make decisions, how we take a logical, how we go logical and emotional in a sense, right? How do we craft something that um, that we created, we think is our baby, and give it away, right? And so basically that's that's what that is. And so I try to approach things with the end in mind. That's why the investor is the last thing, right? Because at the at the end of the day, something's going to happen to this business. It's only going to be one of a few things. Either we're going to just close it, we're going to sell it, or we're going to transfer it down. But at some point, whoever started this business as a founder will one day exit this business. Mm -hmm. But we never think about the end while we're in the beginning or the middle of it, right? And so we never build a business to be, sell to be sold that's profitable, mm -hmm. right? And we never even give ourselves a start. Right. And so that's how I approach it. Prime example, I got a client who's a plumber. I think he makes decent money. Right. We talking somebody who went from uh, let's call it 60 grand a year to um, first year, like fully on his own. He did like 80 on his own. And I was like, yo, you should definitely start, your, you know, do you, quit the job. He like, no, I did. So then I'm like, well, what you trying to do? His answer to me was, I'm just trying to be comfortable. I'm like, well, what does that mean? It's like, my well, son don't want the business. So, and I'm like, you mean to tell me you're going to not grow the business to the potential it could grow because your son don't want it? This is a million dollar industry. I'm working with another client in the same type of field that's making seven figures. Why wouldn't you want to create that? Even if your son don't want it, guess what you can do? Sell it. That's a retirement plan. But we just still trying to be comfortable. 
right? So once we get out of the CEO mode, we go into the business owner. Business owner might be expanding that business. How do we have regional directors, right? Um, departments and such, how we are expanding. And then we move into the investor side of it where we start to acquire businesses or we buy businesses or we jump in into real estate, we jump in into stocks, right? Uh, and that's really, that's just really a wealth blueprint. You look at what the Rockefellers and them did, it's exactly what they did. They made money, started making money hand over fist. He started making so much money, it was a full-time job to manage his own money. Mm. So now we become investors. We start the foundation. That's where Chicago University was birthed, right? That's how we got Spelman. That's how we even got the school system. Right, so that's how we do it. No, this bro, I ain't gonna lie. This is better than I thought. We talked about <laughs> this is good. I wasn't. Damn, this is fire, man. Well, I appreciate uh, you. No, no problem, man. It was a pleasure speaking to you. Uh, for one one more time, how to follow you, how to support you, everything. For sure. So um, y'all can follow me everywhere at Doctor Black Wealth, um, Instagram, TikTok. That's where you can find me. DM me, hit our links, um, set up a book a call. This is good, man. J Hill podcast this is fire this is fire we don't got nothing else to say it's a wrap we out